A budget impasse shutters all Kansas courts today. Why taxpayers may be on the hook for over a million dollars for the Cleaver car wash. West is in, Kelly is out. The results are finally known on the Kansas City, Missouri School Board. And why the mayor may finally get his say on running the district after all. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and thank you for joining us again on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines making news in Kansas City. Reviewing the news this week, the star's chief political correspondent and the host of Up to Date on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske. From The Call newspaper, senior writer Eric Wesson. From NBC Action News, Chris Hernandez. And from the Kansas City star, political analyst, blogger, reporter and columnist, <laughs> Dave Helling. Now, it did take more than a week, but we finally know who is actually serving on the Kansas City, Missouri School Board. After the votes for the write-in candidates were tallied up, Eric Leonard West retained his seat and will remain as the board's president. Dwayne Kelly lost his seat after 12 years. He lost to activist parent and civic volunteer Marisol Montero. Last week, incumbent Arthur Benson also was removed by voters. In all, three new board members will be helping shape the future direction of the district as a result of last week's election. Eric, why was Eric Leonard West unanimously picked this week, though, to continue you leading the board. This is a man, by the way, who announced he only wanted to serve one term. And at one time during his last term, he wanted to be the board president, then he didn't want to be, then he wanted to be again. I guess, you know, just guessing uh, that he is consistent with the direction of what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, the people that support him must have been able to convince the other new board members and other board members to go along with him as another leader. I have no idea other than that. Well, I think it's clear that he wants, or the board itself, wants to just project this image of stability. I mean, given that no one was running for office and most of them were elected through the write-in process and not that many people voted, but looking at what the state is planning to do to them, they just want to project an image of stability. And I think that's probably the main reason why he was... State lawmakers state. looking at this may say, oh, we don't need to do anything now, Steve, because we have three brand new members. This is a very different board now. It is, and I wouldn't count on the state legislature, Nick, to do much of anything thing uh, with, with this whole school board situation with one exception which is to maybe pass a bill that would allow the state to take over more quickly in a situation like this not much happening in Jefferson City this year uh, the legislature split all over the place on what should be done in Kansas City much as so many Kansas Cityans are Nick so don't expect anything to happen in Jeff City. Five and a half weeks or so left of that session. You don't see anything happening there, Dave? No, I agree with my colleague, uh, Mr. Kraske, largely because the legislature can't figure out this problem any more than Kansas Cityans have been able to figure it out for 20 years. No one has yet proposed a, a model for governance of the school board, either at the state level or local level, that gets to the heart of what the problem is or the perceived problem is. So I think legislators, as Steve suggests, are just going to throw up their hands, maybe do something a little bit at the margins before the, uh, yeah. before the end of the year. What that does, though, is continue this sort of state of limbo for the Kansas City, Missouri School District. And I think one of the reasons Eric Leonard West was reelected is because you still have to pay the light bill. You still have to make sure the checks go out to the teachers and, and, and other obligations are met. And you get the sense that as long as that part of the sort of blocking and tackling is being taken care of, that they'll leave him at the top of the board. You know, my sense, Nick, is that the, the city, the school board, the school administration still really hasn't recovered since the day John Cummington announced he was resigning. To me, it was like a, a, a shot in the gut and all our air was exhaled and we really just can't seem to recover from that. My sense is that, that the city is just sort of still in, in, in limbo land, trying to figure out what is the appropriate thing to do next. What's where are we headed with this district? I think the conversation needs to begin at a more robust level on several different fronts. One of those fronts being, is it important to keep this school district uh, intact the way it is now, or is it time to break okay, it? Okay, well, this is not going to be status quo. This is not going to be status quo, Eric. I want to get your opinion on this because, with some people believing this is a board that is on the endangered list, the state lawmakers continue to argue for a state takeover of the the district, which would see the elected school board eliminated. Board President Eric Leonard West proposes a bold plan this week to radically reshape the board 
and give the mayor a role in the district. The plan would be to create a three-member panel of advisors appointed by the mayor who would sit on board meetings. The board needs the public trust, West says, and Mayor James can help restore that. The board would also debate a resolution reducing the number of board members from nine to seven. All seven would represent a sub-district but be elected at large. The board also wants to move the election from April to August when there would probably be more issues on the ballot and a higher turnout. And the mayor would be granted the power to appoint board members when seats become vacant between elections. Now, how is this latest idea being received, Derek? Well, it's, you know, the Urban Summit Group, which is a, a group that meets in the urban core, they're not real warm and fuzzy with Eric Leonard West. So this is his counter, because that group went down to Jeff City. They were able to push Senate Bill 677 and get a five-member panel, of which they would have three or four members on that board. Uh, if things went their way. So I think this was a countermeasure. The question is whether or not uh, Sly James and Victor Callahan have kind of made up because they had some friction there early on in this takeover by the state. But what I wanted to say earlier, I think a lot of the problem has to also lie within the state. If the state knew that they were going to take over and they were going to uh, do the accreditation thing that they did or remove the accreditation. I think they should have had a plan in place so that it could have been smooth sailing from that point on. They're a part of the chaos that's going on and until they come up with a concrete plan then I think you're going to have this back and forth kind of thing and, and leadership uh, determining who's going to do what. Okay, on this plan, Chris Hernandez, is this token involvement for the mayor? Is this the kind of involvement the mayor would welcome? Well, I think they're definitely trying to still tie into the popularity of Sly James, the mayor, and the sort of moral weight that he brings to issues right now because he's still in his honeymoon phase as the new mayor and everyone loves him. It's never going to end. Right, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, so I think that they're still trying to tie into that. He's got a good rep in, in Jeff City, that sort of thing. I do find interesting also this um, proposal to reduce the size of the board. That would certainly help with the issue of not finding enough board member people to run for board seats. But another interesting note is that you finally have two Latinos on the school board, both Crispin Rea and Marisol Montero, because in the past, you have to look at the population of the district. There's, it's about 25% student population is Hispanic. If you reduce the size of the board, is that going to throw off the racial balance once again? So I, that, that would be something I think you'd have to watch when you get down to brass tacks on this. Yeah, but until there's more consensus here in Kansas City, there's more unanimity about the direction the city wants to go, the legislature isn't going to hop on board and, and allow any of this to happen. There needs to be a consensus here. And until that happens, Nick, those folks down there are going to continue to punt on this. It won't happen this session, this issue won't be taken up again until the earliest next January. But the mayor really, really wanted to get involved and engaged and roll up his sleeves in the school district. Is, doesn't this provide him that opportunity, Dave? It, he sort of wanted to really get involved and engaged. We're still not completely clear about how aggressive he was about wanting to take over the district, in part because he failed so miserably at the state level, arguably because he didn't lobby or at least set up the ducks in a row to, to, to take that step. So some involvement is good, Nick, but no one has made the case that I can see as to why it should be five or seven or nine or 14 members, whether the mayor should be involved or have a commission. I mean, the, the ultimate goal has to be better education, and someone has to suggest this governance model will lead to better schools. And so far, no one has made that case locally or at the state level, which is why we're in limbo, as I suggest. Eric. Well, we get back to the original a conversation which Sly uh, put together the plan because the only plan that was on the table was the, was the Urban Summit's plan. And, you know, a lot of people weren't warm and fuzzy about Ms. Grant and Clinton Adams having seats and forming the direction of the school board and, say, and Reverend Mann. So here's the countermeasure. Here's the measure. Now we're back and forth jockeying because actually those are the two only two plans that are on the table. What's the big deal about Kansas City Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver and a car wash that he owns in Grandview? Why would taxpayers be on the hook for more than a million dollars 
to cover a bad loan on the business. According to the Kansas City Star, can, uh, taxpayers rather could be on the hook for up to $1.1 million. The Kansas City Democratic congressman told the newspaper in an email statement that the business, which he and his wife have owned since 2002, have been run by an outside manager. He declined further comment on the legal matter. Now, I'm not quite clear why any of this, though, involves taxpayers, Steve. Well, because uh, he got a small business administration loan to buy this car wash, and, and uh, Dave has covered this even more than I, but there are some provisions uh, in that loan that, uh, re that require taxpayers to step in if the principal can't meet his payments. Now, now w is he getting any special privileges because he was a congressman or a former mayor? that other people would have would have not received? We, we need to make this clear. He obtained the SBA loan uh, as part of the financing package for the purchase in 2002 when he was a private citizen. He was no longer mayor, had not yet been elected to Congress, and there's no indication to date that he's being treated in any way differently than any other SBA borrower uh, for the uh, delinquency on this loan. Uh, having said that, the, the point is that uh, having a federal guarantee enabled him to get the loan originally, uh, the, uh, uh, and SBA will have to step up with a little less than 75 percent of the outstanding principal and interest if a court determines that his company or Diane or Emanuel Cleaver can't make that obligation. That's why taxpayers may be involved. Yeah, Chris. It, it came about a week later, but we did get a chance to talk with him on camera Thursday. And um, his defense of this, he, he won't go into the details of the lawsuit because he says he won't litigate it on TV, which, you know, that's one way to get around talking about the lawsuit itself. But his defense of his handling of this and the issue with, you know, he's handling the people's money versus handling his own business is that he thinks voters will understand that in this poor economy, a lot of places have had problems and that his car wash is no different. Now, as, the, as far as the SBA loan, when I was talking to the local spokesperson, she brought up a very interesting point. Think about this. This was 02, in the go-go days of banks handing out loans to anyone who showed up in the office, basically. And she clearly said a couple of times, if Bank of America did not follow all the proper lending rules, they would be on the hook for all the money, not the SBA. Emmanuel Cleaver running for re-election this year. Uh, can I I'll, back up again? Yes, please. <laughs> I think We're he, backing up. I, We're I, rewinding, I, Eric, and it's your turn. I think his situation is a lot different than other people with SBAs because these loans default uh, quite a bit. But I haven't seen any that get a week's worth of media coverage as well. Chris brings up another very valid point as well, and that point is that Bank of America just settled a $25 billion partnership settlement with 49 states on their loan procedures. So in actuality, if the court determines, you know what, this is Bank of America's loan, it was bad, you're responsible for it and not taxpayers, I think it was premature to determine if whether or not taxpayers are going to be on the hook for it or not. And I think that they said they could be, but the media outlets took it as taxpayers would be responsible. And I think That's that that I was a, I know, right. I know. Okay. you yeah. said they okay. could be. Right. But they it, made it clear, but I think you're yeah. right. The interpretation the is The interpretation oh on the blogs and in other outlets is that taxpayers are going to be footing this bill and it's, it's giving Jacob Turk a, a sign of relief or well, fresh air. But go ahead. Well, it, this is giving Jacob Turk yeah. the Republican uh, a huge issue to flog uh, the mayor with. Having said that, I don't think Congressman Cleaver is in any dire political straits because of this deal. His di new district, if it stands the way we think it's going to stand, is even more Democratic than the current district is. He should be okay. Having said all that, this issue has been dogging this congressman for almost a decade now. It was a big issue when he ran against Jimmy Metzl in the Democratic primary in 04, and then uh, Gene Patterson uh, that same year. TV ads about this car wash and everything else. He said at the time he was going to sell the car wash. One question we still don't have answered, Nick, is why hasn't he sold the well, car wash? I think, he, I think he had a closing deal on it in 2005. The economy tanked two weeks before they were going to close on it. The people backed out of it. Yeah, let me and just that's say, my understanding. One of the of reasons it. that this has received a week-long coverage, unlike other SBA uh, loans, is because he, Emmanuel Cleaver is a member of Congress. He's on the Financial Services Committee. He's chairman of the Black con uh, Congressional Black Caucus. All of that is relevant to his personal responsibility for this loan. And I think the biggest problem politically, Nick, is not necessarily whether taxpayers are on the hook or not, but Emmanuel Cleaver always 
in his career tends to blame other people for his problems. He still hasn't taken responsibility for this loan. It's the business manager. It's the Bank of America. It's SBA. It's all their fault. The, the, when, when he didn't pay his property taxes on the, on the car wash, someone else's fault. Uh, someone else should have taken care of that. At some point, voters are going to ask their member of Congress to take responsibility for his or her decisions, and I think that's where the political problem lies, and not necessarily whether taxpayers pay a dime for that car wash. Is the public willing to forgive the financial problems facing its public officials? In the race for Missouri <clears throat> governor, the main Republican candidate running against Jay Nixon, Dave Spence, is running on a simple platform. He's a businessman, and Missouri is a business. But an examination of tax and finance records show that Spence's companies have been late paying property, personal property, manufacturers, and other taxes totaling tens of thousands of dollars dating to 1995 and as recently as 2010. Now, this is the same candidate who claimed on, the ca on his campaign materials that he had a degree in economics, but later acknowledged it was a degree in home economics, right? How are these latest revelations impacting his campaign against Governor Nixon? Well, they don't help. And this was a, a campaign that was a long shot to begin with, Nick. So many leading Republicans, including Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder, looked at running against Jay Nixon and ultimately backed away. Dave Spence sort of stepped up. No one knows who he is. Never been a public official before in his career. So he had a long, hard slog to begin with against a fairly uh, stable governor in Democrat Jay Nixon. But the, the Democratic uh, researchers have done a great job in terms of uh, dredging up a lot of this past material about Dave Spence, including his inability to pay taxes, including some discrepancies on his college degree. These things hurt just as Dave Spence is trying to get out of the gate, Nick. And uh, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, political observers are looking at this race thinking Dave Spence is just not going to get there in terms of being the kind of formidable candidate Republicans would need to oust an incumbent like Jay Nixon. And this goes back, though, to the question, just as we talked about with Emmanuel Cleaver, though, of, you know, there are tough things that happen in life. And how much, but, given a whole range of issues that you deal with and look at with a candidate, how much do you well, look at these clearly kinds of Clearly, it issues? shows that this can happen on both sides of the political fence. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, we were just talking about a Democrat, now we're talking about a Republican. And what, what's interesting here is, is his defense of this so far seems to be that, you know, he's a businessman with a lot of different business interests, very busy running all of that. And some of these little things happen and that he has occasionally stepped up when a renter didn't pay and, and took care of it. And, and the question is, will that wash but, with the... The, the voters and and how uh, how well can he get that message across? Yeah. Yes, the, Dave. The, the biggest problem with David Spence and Emmanuel Cleaver and to a degree Claire McCaskill on her and, and airplane. Didn't, although didn't Kathleen Sebelius also have yeah, some tax issues recently? The, the, all voters are very willing to forgive these kind of problems if the politician will step forward and say, Nick, I screwed up. And that's the last thing most politicians ever want to say. He tried to talk to David Spence about this, and we got a spokesman instead. I mean, once someone steps forward and accepts responsibility for these problems, I think the public is very forgiving. But time after time after time, there's some attempt to blame it on other people, and I think that's David Spence's problem in this particular story as but well. But you still can't, yes. you still can't air this out in, in the media. You, you, have to, you have to be able to say, okay, what are all the facts? Uh, in Spence's case, you know, that it is what it is. In Claire's case, it is what it is. And with Cleaver's case, it is what it is. But you can't air it out in the, in the public. Well, it's, well I, if, that's you can't, my issue if you with can't it. air it out in public, then you can't be a member of a publicly elected body. Yeah. You, should, you, you shouldn't yeah. run if you're for a private, If you're a private citizen and have these problems, sure, you don't have to litigate it in the media. But, but voters expect more. But, voters expect yes. some explanation. Steve, but but when I got okay, the, let, okay. let's, let's Steve, <laughs> Steve speak for a moment. political reporter talk now? Yes. Let's Steve speak. speak for a moment. Okay. It's particularly difficult for a candidate like Dave Spence, who is framing his entire right. campaign, Nick, around the notion. I want to be the CEO of Missouri, implying he's going to make the trains run on time, we're going to pay our bills on time, <laughs> we're going to run this state like a business. His words, not mine. That's what creates an image problem for Dave Spence. And I think Thank it does, you. you're welcome. And I think it does go back to what Dave said, although I would frame it in the, in the terms of authenticity. I mean, that's what voters buy into. I mean, they have become so jaded about the back and forth yes. of the Great campaigns, yes. throwing out this, that, throwing mud, trying to make a tiny little charge stick. And, and it is an authenticity issue. If you address 
address the issue in a way that voters believe, yeah. then they accept your explanation. Okay. Courts across Kansas will be closed today. This will affect thousands who need marriage licenses, protective orders, and other day-to-day -day necessities of life. The entire court system is being shuttered because of a Kansas legislative impasse, and there are going to be more forced court closing days ahead. State lawmakers recently adjourned their regular session of the legislature in Topeka without approving a budget for the courts. Kansas Supreme Court Chief Justice Lawton Nuss ordered Kansas courts shut down and 1,500 employees furloughed without pay. The legislature doesn't return for its wrap-up session until April 25th, where most of the important issues of the session still have to be resolved. But this seems like an extreme measure shutting down the courts. Steve. Well, it is. Uh, in defense of the courts, they said we needed some extra money to cover some increased costs. They asked the legislature for that money. The legislature simply didn't do its job in terms of appropriating an extra nut to get the courts through the fiscal year. And the courts are saying they had no choice. Now, Republican leaders in the legislature are saying, well, hey, you all have a bunch of funds uh, stashed away in different reserve accounts. You could have used that. The judges are saying, no, that's not the case. This, these, these monies are segregated for certain reasons. We can't use that money. It's a mess, Nick. And the problem is Kansans who need these courts and need to be in court to do one thing or another aren't going to realize so many of them that the courts are closed. There's going to be a lot of angry people out there the next few weeks. Doesn't Eric. the courts generate money? Doesn't they generate uh, well, revenue Well, that's one of the problems. The they have not generated as much revenue because there have been fewer filings. And so the that's problem right. is they just don't have as much money as they used to have. As a political matter, it, it, uh, Sam Brownback could do worse, and the legislature could do worse than picking a battle with the courts. I think the courts are not held in extraordinarily high esteem, uh, esteem politically, not in terms of how we have to get things done in the state, but just as a political matter. And closing just on Friday, with one furlough uh, uh, day for court employees may not cause the kind of damage that maybe the court people anticipate. Life will go on. And so as a political matter, it's probably not a bad battle to fight. Well, and even though you can vote on judges to retain them and all that, it, it's not like people look at them and say, why are they getting involved in this political spat? I mean, I think it, it, right. it enables them to send a message to the legislature, like, don't mess yes. with us because we can just shut down. Um, and then it happened before during the recession. I mean, it happened in Kansas, it happened in Iowa, other states have done that. But there is the concern this week, uh, the, certainly the legislature is on its recess. They're not going to return until the wrap-up session at the end of the month. Uh, and a lot of the big issues of the session are still unresolved, yet we have a government who says he's accomplishing all of these things. What has been accomplished this session, Steve? Well, not that much yet, Nick. The, as you just said, all the big uh, heavy lifting is going to occur during this wrap-up session. There are folks who are saying this wrap-up session could set a record for the longest wrap-up session in state history because they put so many big issues into this, uh, into this part of the legislative work. The big issue, I think, is going to be some sort of tax cut package. Brownback really staking his administration on cutting taxes. They haven't dealt with that yet. Some Something probably will pass in that, on that. I, I see the mayor's chief of staff resigning this week. Yes. Uh, is there a backstory to that? Uh, Go Governor Brownback's uh, chief of staff, Dave uh, Kensinger, stepped down. We don't think so. He says he has uh, other fish to fry. He's a big political guy. Lots of money to be made in a, in a big election year like this is. That's what he's going to be going off and doing. How about in Missouri? What's been happening there? We do know that Missouri Governor Jay Nixon is off to Brazil this weekend. He's off with the First Lady Saturday on a five-day trade mission to Sao Paulo to expand Missouri exports to the South American country. And we're told by the travel costs are being covered by the Hawthorne Foundation, a nonprofit group funded and run by Missouri <clears throat> businesses that often finances gubernatorial trips related to economic development. We talked about what's being accomplished in Kansas this session. What about Missouri? Is there any major significant legislation that has passed this year? No, I, I, they're, they, <laughs> the budget, I mean, they're working on the budget and they will get a budget, budget, and that's important to have done. But in an election year, it's, it's highly difficult, particularly a gubernatorial election year, to pass major legislation. Certainly, Jay Nixon isn't being aggressive in proposing a big package of reforms or improvements. They're tinkering at the margin. Uh, I don't think anyone is surprised that the Missouri session has been rather lackluster to date. Well, I would yeah. chime in simply by saying that um, I think some people in Kansas City will think that the lack of action on the school district, given the proposals that were out there, is actually good for Kansas City, just because some of the more but, drastic but things I, you know, Everybody did expect something to happen this year on that.
And then we on, on last week, of course, we had Teva Pharmaceuticals moving yeah. to um, Overland Park from its place at I-435 and uh, Holmes Road, that something would have happened in terms of uh, economic incentives. None of that has happened no, either. No, I think voters should be really upset about this. There, there's become this, this sort of uh, uh, thought in, in political science circles these days that nothing can happen in an election year, nothing will happen. We all sort of sit back and, and say that's okay because it's an election year. That shouldn't be okay anymore. Congress can't deal with soaring budget deficits. Missouri can't deal with economic development, uh, ethics issues that are so important. And everyone sits back and says, well, that's because it's an election year. That's not a very good excuse. And, and the budget and basically the outside the school district, the budget, the only thing that you really have heard about uh, to any degree is the, the budget cuts to programs for the blind. And I think those are the two things that people yeah. have been focused mm -hmm. on, the school district and what are you going to do we for poor defenses of yes. blind people. Yeah. Yeah. And also uh, restricting uh, tanning beds for teenagers. <laughs> that was a very important <laughs> issue. And obviously uh, Rush Limbaugh and whether he should be in exactly. the Missouri. You know, Paul, exactly. things, Missouri <laughs> seconds. Yes, very Most quickly, of the very important quickly. decisions in Missouri, Nick, will be made potentially at the ballot box on things like the income tax and That's voter right. ID and yeah. other things in November. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the call, Eric Wesson, and from the Kansas City Star, Dave Helling. The star, Steve Kraske, who also keeps us up to date weekday mornings at 11 on KCUR-FM. And keeping you updated every day whenever important news is happening, Chris Hernandez of 41 Action News. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.